Hello and welcome to my new webinar series geared towards the questions that partners are asking and where Microsoft can help. In this week's episode, we're going to be discussing open source, and I'm delighted to be joined by Justin Davies, a tech solution professional and all round open source guru here at Microsoft. Justin, thanks for joining us today. Would you mind giving our listeners a quick introduction? Thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, as Dan said, my name is Justin Davis. I'm a technical solutions professional at Microsoft. So I help our customers uh, and partners to be able to adopt and use open source um, to be able to accelerate the use of cloud computing for their businesses. So let me get straight to the point. Now, to this day, when we say Microsoft, people instinctively think Windows. But the reality is Microsoft are huge in the open source space, and we've made some great contributions to the community. In fact, I think that I read that as a company, we have over 5,000 contributors committed to over 8,000 packages, which is just staggering. So I guess my first question to you today is, Justin, can you give our listeners a quick overview of Microsoft's open source strategy? So I've been working with open source for the past 20 years, and historically, as you said, Microsoft and open source didn't really go together. Microsoft was a software company and the source code for what Microsoft did was owned by Microsoft and controlled by Microsoft as well. So over those 20 years, the grandfather of open source projects, Linux has gained a phenomenal following. Running most of the internet, running on desktops, discrete devices, phones, you name it, Linux will run on it. The momentum and popularity and quality of what can be achieved by the open source community is in plain view for everyone to see and, and Linux is, is one of those fantastic examples. Fast forward about 10 years ago, and there was an, this explosion in open source languages. So things like PHP, Ruby, Perl, JavaScript, um, and that solved some really interesting problems. So let's take uh, kind of one of the oldest languages that's out there, PHP. It was a language that was specifically designed for web applications, or JavaScript on the client and server closed that gap between front end and back end developers. And in, in the background hosting, all of those languages and framework, frameworks was the juggernaut that was Linux itself. The premise and popularity of open source can be boiled down to a couple of things. And I will get to the point that you were asking before about Microsoft and open source, but I do need to give some background. So the fact that, that it removed the need to reinvent the wheel every single time that you were doing something. So if I had a, if there was a framework that had been designed by you know, an individual person or, or a group of people that was doing something which fixed the problem for me, it meant that I could just go get that code, either build upon it or just use it myself. So all of these people collaborated together to enhance and to fix the software and to basically make it better and better. Uh, the keys of the kingdom are not held by a single entity. And with this, a number of things started to happen at Microsoft. The first thing is that Satya Nadella, who historically has been a developer and was the VP of our cloud division before he became CEO. And as a developer, he, he understood the power and capability of developing in the open and collaborating with a diverse community. Admittedly, that diverse community was a community within Microsoft, but it does uh, have an impact in terms of, of where we went. Secondly, we hire developers all the time at Microsoft from, from university or out of college um, and, and from in the industry as well. Nearly all of those people come from an open source background or have grown up developing with open source software. And so that kind of pervasive use of, of open source actually came into Microsoft with all of the people that we were hiring as well. So we've got a huge skill set of, of open source background within the company. And it's fantastic to see. And finally, we've got Azure as well. Our customers don't just use Microsoft technologies on Azure. They don't just use Microsoft technologies on premise either. And so for us, we had to make sure that that platform was there and ready to be able to take non Microsoft technologies. Totally agree. Open source is heavily featured on our cloud platform and Satya has made it perfectly clear that Microsoft are all in on this technology. So can you give our listeners some examples of open source on Azure? So from a technical perspective, we've enabled Linux to run as best as it possibly can on, on our hypervisor, Hyper-V. I think the year we contributed the synthetic code, LIS, or Linux integration services to the Linux kernel, we were the top single contributor to the code base. 
So now that this uh, subsystem is part of the core Linux kernel, all modern Linux distributions will run exceptionally well on Azure as a platform. Uh, not only do we make sure Linux runs very well on Azure, but we also do some really nice things from a hardware perspective uh, that kind of highlights the, the integration of LIS and, and the Azure platform itself. So I don't think a lot of people know this, but all physical hosts within Azure data centers contain an FPGA, which is a field programmable gate array. It's a controller which basically allows you to be able to reprogram in hardware. Um, the FPGA is essentially leapfrogs the network device within the host and goes directly into the bus, which, which connects into to the CPU. This allows a few really nice things. One, it means that we can offer a way for customers to be actually reprogramming those uh, hardware devices to be able to do things like accelerated machine learning. Uh, if you want to find out more about that, just do a Google or a Bing <laughs> for Project Brainwave uh, and you can find out more information about that. Uh, the second one, which kind of highlights the integration of the hardware and the software that we have, um, is that we can enable something called accelerated networking. That essentially offloads a lot of the networking um, infrastructure uh, from a compute perspective onto the FPGA and allows us to be able to reduce the latency and increase the throughput uh, of, of the network and for our customers. So we worked with Canonical who make the Ubuntu Linux distribution to essentially write drivers and integrate that into their core kernel and that's being rolled out to other platforms as well. So those types of things would never have been able to be possible without the, the LIS drivers that are part of the core Linux kernel. Um, some other really nice things, again, that people may not know about is that part of our uh, top of rack switches actually runs on Linux. So the things which actually do the shifting of the data between uh, our racks is actually a Linux distribution that we wrote and put together that sits within our hardware as well. Um, and all of the all of the hardware or most of the hardware that we actually run within the Azure data centers has actually been contributed to the open source hardware initiative as well, uh, along with Facebook. So, you know, it's not just about Linux and it's not just about code. It's actually hardware as well. Linux is literally part of the fabric. So that covers kind of the IS and the operating system side of things. But the, the work that we've done as well with other open source companies and communities to actually take the best in breed software and offers those those as a service to our customers. Two top examples of this and ones which have been in our uh, kind of ecosystem for quite a while is Redis, the Redis cache, uh, and what the work that we've done with Hortonworks as well. So Redis is a distributed key value store, uh, which allows you to essentially uh, store small pieces of, of data and retrieve those extremely quickly and at scale as well. So with a few clicks in the portal, you can essentially spin up a Redis cluster uh, and you're good to go. This is as opposed to you then having to you know, provision virtual machines, provision networking storage, make sure that all of that is scalable and so on and so forth. We provide that to you with a service level and essentially take away a lot of the operational burden for, from you and allow you to just get on and, and consume that service. So HD Insights, which is our big data appliance, does the same thing. We work with Hortonworks to essentially take their software with a few clicks within the portal or using the command line interface. It essentially just spins that up for you and your data scientists are ready to go. So no messing around with compute, no messing around with storage. And we do other services as well, um, which I'll come on to a little bit later and predominantly the, the managed Kubernetes service, which I'm, I'm a big fanboy of at the moment. Um, the third way that we work with open source is to take our software either at inception or, or existing closed source software and open source them on, on sites like GitHub, for example. So a few examples of, of things that have either started out in the open or have been released into the open and are developed in the open are VS Code. So one of the most popular development environments and text editors uh, out there at the moment. CNTK, which is our machine learning framework, which underpins all of the cognitive services that we have on Azure. .NET Core, literally the crown jewels of our development uh, core within Microsoft, is now developed in the open. Um, and we take contributions from, from people outside of Microsoft into, into the core of that as well. ACS Engine, which is the framework that deploys all of our Kubernetes clusters for both uh, managed Kubernetes and for our customers to be able to use, is all developed in the open. And Service Fabric, the key orchestration framework that underpins all of our PaaS services, so SQL as a service, for example, MySQL as a service, uh, web apps for Linux, all of that is orchestrated using Service Fabric. So um, you know, all of that's there and ready for you to be able to look at the source code or to be able to download it and use yourself uh, with an open source license. So I, as a Microsoft employee, am allowed to open source anything I like on behalf of Microsoft and actually actively encouraged to be able to do this as a UDAN, as is everyone else within the company. Uh, 
And finally, a large number of Microsoft employees directly contribute to open source projects. This is everything from the Linux kernel itself to Python, the programming languages, TensorFlow, which is Google's uh, machine learning framework, Kubernetes, and an awful lot in between as well. And we've got 54 data center regions and hundreds of data centers around the world. And when you run any software at that kind of scale, uh, you know, you can break it, you can, you can push it to its limits. And when we see that, we work with the community to either fix it ourselves and contribute it back or work to be able to actually get that uh, back into the main line of the code and, and get that back into the community. It's... So underpinning all of this work that we actually do uh, with kind of enablement and contribution to open source, we're a member of a number of open source foundations as well. So things like the Linux Foundation, the Cloud Foundry Foundation, um, we have representation on the Cloud Native Compute Foundation as well, and also the Apache Foundation. Now, this allows us to be able to fund or to help fund those organizations and, and, and drive innovation within open source uh, even further, but also allows us to be able to listen to those communities and to be able to contribute back as an organization with, with the scale that we kind of have really within Microsoft. So these are really exciting times at Microsoft from an open source perspective. So it's pretty clear that we're doing lots with open source. Can we now shift focus and maybe take a look at a couple of demos? So there are two technologies that I seem to kind of mess around with uh, on a daily basis with myself and, and with customers. So the first one is Terraform. And Terraform is basically a way that allows customers to be able to spin up infrastructure in a repeatable way. So the fact that cloud is all software defined now, as in the customers don't physically touch any infrastructure, means that we're able to define infrastructure as code. One of the most popular ways to do this is, is as I said, using Terraform, which is which is open source and, and developed uh, by the open source community and with HashiCorp, who are the company that kind of are the, the custodians, I would say, of, of the software. So Terraform allows you to use a descriptive language to be able to say, I want a virtual machine with this operating system, this amount of disk, and this type of network configuration. But it isn't just limited to, to virtual machines or infrastructure as a service. So you can basically say, I want to be able to define a network security group, which is kind of the inbuilt firewalls that we have within, within Azure, uh, SQL as a service, uh, or MySQL as a service, or Cosmos DB, which is our global uh, globally distributed database system, um, and even a fully functioning Kubernetes cluster as well. So pretty much everything that you can define or spin up within Azure can be defined and, and as infrastructure as code uh, with Terraform. Uh, being able to define the infrastructure of code allows your ops teams to be able to have an audit trail of changes, as well as having the ability to be able to spin up and tear down in a well-defined and repeatable way. One of the nice things that Terraform and public cloud provides is the ability to be able to clone environments for, for one-shot usage. I'll give you an example of this. When releasing a new piece of software or software component into production, ideally you would want to have a carbon copy of that production environment to be able to work against, to be able to test against. You don't want to test in production. So same size, potentially the same amount of data. Traditionally, what you'd have to do is to purchase that pre-production environment and have it sitting there idle for most of the time unless you're running, you know, unless you're running an acceptance test. So you could say that you know, you're only running that the infrastructure for 10% of the time and wasting a lot of money. In this kind of new world of software defined world of infrastructure, you can use Terraform to take that production definition uh, and then essentially deploy that when you're ready to, ready to run your acceptance tests, run your tests and then tear the, tear the environment down. So if your tests only last for three hours, you literally only pay for those three hours of usage. This isn't just something that Terraform allows you to be able to do. It's what public cloud provides for you. But to be able to define that within software is really, really powerful. So let's take a simple Terraform script to set up a container running a small application and also to, to spin up a Cosmos DB instance as the backing store. OK, so here we are logged into the Azure Cloud Shell. Uh, it just basically gives you a nice little virtual machine, which is sitting within the Azure infrastructure um, and allows you to be able to save files and to be able to, to work with, with the Azure command line. Um, it's really nice, especially if you can't have SSH access um, or you don't have command line access in any of your infrastructure that you have uh, on your laptop, for example, if it's locked down. So it is just a, a Linux machine. So let's just have a look. Got a few things uh, in this directory. Um, I also have the Azure command line on here as well, uh, as well as Terraform, which is what this presentation or this part of the demo is actually going to be. Okay. So let's just go into my OSS, so open source with Dan directory. Um, what we have here is just a very simple uh, Terraform script. Uh, the first one is, let's just have a look at the code is just a simple 
resource group definition. So I'm going to create uh, TF Edinburgh on Azure, uh, call it Edinburgh on Azure, and the location is going to be uh, East US as well. So let's just go ahead and close the editor just so you can see what I'm doing. So if I do Terraform in it, and the great thing about when you run uh, things like Terraform and, and kubectl uh, and Ansible within the Cloud Shell is that they are pre-authenticated. So they're authenticated to be able to use the Azure infrastructure. Usually you'd have to do an AZ login uh, to be able to actually log in and, and work with Terraform or with any of the other uh, systems that rely on an Azure token. Here it's already done for you. So I've initialized uh, Terraform within my RG directory. If I just do a Terraform plan, and in true Terraform style, what it's going to do is look in the TF file and check against the Azure infrastructure to be able to see, uh, does that resource group already exist? It says it doesn't. So actually with the green dot here, it says it's going to create it. So if we do Terraform uh, apply, and so, as I said, we haven't done any authentication against Azure. This is already there and baked into the Cloud Shell itself. It's now going to go ahead and create my resource group. So nice and quick, we can see that the resource group has been created here. Now, if we want something a little bit more complex than just creating a resource group, let's just have a look at what we have here. So we have Terraform Edinburgh on Azure. So that's already been created. Here, we're actually going to be creating a Cosmos DB instance, and it's relatively simple. And Cosmos DB is quite a complex uh, database, but all we need to do is just pass it along the parameters that you usually would be passing when you're spinning up a Cosmos DB instance in the Azure portal. So we give it the name with a random string here because the name has to be unique across uh, the fully qualified domains, uh, domain namespace. The location, which is actually pulled in from the resource group. So th these are standard Terraform uh, naming conventions. It's going to pull the location from here into the Cosmos DB location. The resource group name is the resource group that we've created in the, this group here. Uh, consistency level or consistency policy is, is session based. Failover policy location, so we're only having one instance rather than multiple failovers for Cosmos DB is East US. Uh, and I can add a, an Azure tag onto this as well, which gets tagged into the portal. We then go over to the ACI, the Azure Container Instance uh, definition, very similar to the Cosmos DB. We're taking the location from the resource group we've created, the resource group name. We're going to give it a public IP address. OS type is Linux, and it's basically going to pull down uh, a container from my, my public Docker repository and set the CPU and memory limits, as well as exporting the port. This is what I really like about Cosmos DB, uh, sorry, about, <laughs> about Terraform. I don't know what my connection string for my Cosmos DB instance that I'm going to create is going to be up front. So what Terraform is going to do by using uh, variable interpolation is take the account name, uh, the primary key, which has also been generated um, when Cosmos DB is, is created, uh, as well as the name and also the, the rest of the connection string. So I know what the connection string is formed of, but actually what I don't know is, is all of the things like the, the connection keys. So all of that is going to be created on the fly by Terraform. So it's all very nice and very, very easy to be able to use. So if I close the text editor, let's do a Terraform init. Same thing, that's just going to download the Terraform um, providers for Azure and Random, which I'm using as well. If I do Terraform plan. So again, that's going to go away, check what resources are already in Azure, and come back and tell me what it actually needs to create. Okay, so we've got the ACI, account, Cosmos DB account, uh, and the resource group as well. So if we do Terraform apply, Just say yes. Now what it's going to do is to go away and actually start creating the Cosmos DB instance. It's going to create the resource group and also create the Azure Container instance as well. So we're just going to pause the video here for a second because it takes a few minutes to be able to spin all of this stuff up uh, and we'll come back to it and, and log into the portal and see what that looks like. Okay, so that's all been created now. We have a, a Cosmos DB instance, we have a container which is talking to it as well. So now let's just go over to the portal, 
have a look what that infrastructure actually looks like. So say yes, we want to leave the page. Fingers crossed it remembers my credentials and logs me straight back in. Yes, it does. Okay, so if we just go over to my resource groups. And this one was Edinburgh on Azure. So we have the Cosmos DB instance and we have uh, our container as well. So let's just get the IP address of that container. One, there you go. So let's have a look what that container looks like here. Oh, let's try that again. Copy. And so we just have a very small web app, uh, which is just showing some prices. Although actually I've just realized that the stock market is closed in the US, so it's not gonna show me prices at the moment, but it would do uh, if, if, if the stock market was open. So relatively simple, you know, container, Cosmos DB, and everything is instantiated by, uh, by Terraform as well. Now it's all well and good. I did say that you could also close down or tear down some of this infrastructure as well. So we've got that. If you just imagine that you'll be using a CICD pipeline or something like that, you can actually now go and destroy all of that infrastructure in the same way that we would expect to be able to do with Terraform. So Azure Dan, let's go to Terraform. And so if I then do Terraform destroy, just checking everything that we have there, checking everything against what's going on in the Terraform files and also what we have in the portal. And now it's now saying that we're going to remove the container instance Cosmos DB, uh, the random uh, ID for the server and also the resource group. Hit go and it starts to tear it down, essentially doing the exact reverse as what it was doing before. And that's it. It's, it's just a way of you, you know, in, in this situation, we haven't actually done anything with the Azure portal, apart from looking to see what infrastructure is there. Um, you use a tool which you're used to uh, by using Terraform, and you can define pretty much everything that we have within Azure in terms of services within Terraform to be able to spin those up and shut them down in a recreatable way using infrastructure as code. So the second piece of software that I, I use on a daily basis is, is Kubernetes. Um, and Kubernetes is, is quite an interesting open source project and, and kind of has a very special place in a lot of the engineering team's hearts within Microsoft. But uh, let's go back a couple of steps in terms of why customers would use something like Kubernetes. So when you're moving to the cloud or if you're developing software, it's really nice to be able to actually develop on your laptop, say, and, and that code and that package of code and configuration that you have is exactly the same on your laptop as what it is that runs on production as well. It mitigates the risk of, of the kind of uh, builds, release and deployment stages that you would usually go through as a developer. Um, being able to push changes into production uh, with, with kind of little risk allows you to actually do that a lot more often. So it allows you to be able to actually uh, respond to your customers, to be able to respond to market demands or regulatory demands uh, a lot quicker. It means that as you change smaller pieces of code or smaller amounts of code, again, that risk of introducing an, an issue or a bug into production is greatly reduced as well. So kind of increased volume uh, in terms of the amount of times that you can push into production with a decrease in risk as well. And containerization is a way to be able to actually do that for you. Now, that's all well and good when you've got a single component that you want to be able to push into production or that you're working on or a small uh, application. But most modern software is made up of multiple applications or multiple components as well. And so when you start looking about how you have in this containerized world, multiple containers, how do you scale those individual components? How do you make sure that those components are guaranteed to be running all the times? How do you make sure that you those components can actually talk to each other uh, in a uniform and consistent way? And that really is the, the role of an orchestrator. An orchestrator essentially takes all of those containers for you and will make sure that they are scheduled, that they are available, that they are resilient, uh, that they can talk to each other and that they are healthy as well. So there are a few open source and a few um, orchestrators out there. The most popular one I would say at the moment is, is Kubernetes. Um, it's got a huge following from an open source perspective. Uh, and also, you know, a lot of the cloud providers are, are offering 
uh, Kubernetes based systems for you to be able to, to use as well. So we recently re released AKS or Azure Kubernetes Service, um, which is a managed Kubernetes service. And it'll, we take care of the deployment and the availability and the scalability of that cluster as well. So we're all you as a customer or you as a partner who's working with a customer needs to worry about are the workloads that you wish to be able to put on there. So the containers and the pods that you're actually deploying onto that cluster. Um, we also allow you to be able to scale that cluster up and down. So let's say you started with a three node or three virtual machines as part of that cluster. If you had uh, a situation where you needed to be able to scale it up from three to, to 50 nodes, you just issue an AKS scale uh, command that will scale that for you. We'll deploy the Kubernetes agents and we'll be able to tie those into the cluster. And this is all done for you. You don't need to mess around with certificates or anything else like that. So we've taken a lot of that pain uh, out of it for you. And for anyone that's listening to this that's ever done uh, an upgrade of a Kubernetes cluster, uh, you'll know it can be a complete pain. Uh, so what we do there as well is we allow you to be able to do an AKS upgrade command so you can switch from, uh, let's say, 1.9 to, to 1.10 of Kubernetes. Uh, keeping all your workloads running as well. So from an operational perspective, we just make your life an awful lot simpler. So the prevalence of containers within our customers is, is not just limited to, to Kubernetes either. So um, we also work with the likes of Red Hat with their OpenShift offering, Docker with their Docker Enterprise Orchestrator, as well as, well as Pivotal with, with Cloud Foundry. So these are best in breed container orchestrators that will fit uh, you know, different requirements for different customers in terms of what you're doing. And we make sure that from a, both an, an engineering perspective and from a commercial and strategic perspective, that we are working in step with each other to be able to make sure that their best in breed software um, systems run as perfectly as they possibly can within Azure from an integrated perspective. Okay, so let's jump to a demo. Uh, we've looked at the uh, Cloud Shell before. We're just going to use that to be able to spin up an Azure AKS uh, cluster. So one of the first things you need to be able to do with anything on Azure is to be able to create a resource group. So AZ group create uh, Azure DAN location East US. Oh, that's going to go wrong. Need to give it a name, Azure Dan, location, East US. So that'll come back relatively quickly. So we've got a resource group now. Let's go ahead and create an AKS cluster. So AZ AKS create name. Let's call that Azure Dan as well. And let's put it into the resource group that we just created now as well. So we just go ahead and do that. By default, what this is going to do is create a Kubernetes cluster uh, with three agent machines in there. Um, in its own uh, virtual network. Uh, and then that will essentially take round about, I think, maybe seven to 10 minutes to be able to spin that infrastructure up. So let's just pause the video now uh, and we'll carry on setting that up and actually deploying some workloads in a second. Okay, so our Kubernetes cluster has been created. That's all well and good. Now what we actually need to do is be able to start interacting with it using uh, kube control, kubectl. So one of the first things I need to do uh, after creating a Kubernetes cluster is to actually bring down the uh, cluster configuration so that I can actually start interacting with it. So we have a nice convenient command to be able to do that, which is az aks uh, get credentials. Uh, with the name of the cluster, so Azure Dan, uh, and the group as well. And what that's going to do is go talk to Azure, pull down the cluster context, will now allows me to go kubectl get nodes. So from here on in, it's just standard interaction with, with kubectl. So I could do kubectl o, uh, get wide as well, just to be able to get different uh, information with regards to the IP address and the kernel version as well. So we have our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we don't have any workloads running at the moment. So let's go and push something up there. So if we go back into open source with Dan, cube. So uh, let's just have a look at these files. I have a service definition um, for a service running on port 80, uh, which I'm going to expose uh, as a load balancer. So an external IP address, uh, external Azure IP address is going to be assigned uh, and read you through a load balancer. And the deployment spec is just very, very simple um, Docker file, which I've created, um, name hello, give it some CPU, um, also export port 80 as well. So quite simple uh, one shot 
uh, type of deployment. So let's close this. And first of all, do QTTL apply. Uh, let's deploy the service first, because that takes a little bit of time. What's going to happen here is because uh, we already have the, the Azure um, CNI installed, pre-baked into uh, the version of Kubernetes which has been deployed. Uh, when I do a load balancer uh, request, it knows that it will go and talk to Azure and spin up that load balancer. So the Kubernetes cluster is pre-authenticated against the Azure API as well. So let's have a look at how we're doing now. QCTL, get service. So you can see that the load balancer now is in pending state. That means that uh, the request has gone over to Azure uh, for a load balancer uh, configuration to be instantiated uh, and to actually plumb that back in now to any of the selectors that we have in our deployment. So let's just go ahead and do kubectl apply F and let's now do the, depl the deployment. Whoops, minus F. So kubectl get deployments. Try that again. So we have desired, current, and up to date. They're not quite there yet. So if you do kubectl get pods, we'll probably see that uh, yeah, we're running and we're good to go. So this is really simple. We've just instantiated a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we've pulled down the context for the cluster as well. Uh, we've got an existing uh, deployment configuration, also a service configuration, which we have pushed up into into the Kubernetes cluster, and that is it. I mean, it's relatively simple. You haven't had to uh, provision soft, uh, provision operating systems. You haven't had to define what the storage is. You haven't had to define what your network configuration is or your network security policies. We've done all of that for you. It's just there and ready to go for you as a service. So let's just see now, kubectl get service, see if our IP address has been assigned. Okay, so while we're waiting for that, let's just do some, because at the moment we have pods, kubectl get pods. So we have one pod running on the first server. So let's now go ahead and kubectl scale deployment hello replicas equals three. Kubectl get pods. So we just scaled that um, those pods now to three or the deployment to, to three pods and see how we're doing in terms of pushing that out. So kubectl get pods and give it a wide format. And we have a pod on server zero, server one and server two. So you know, as you're scaling up and scaling these things down, you can also do a scale up and a scale down of the underlying infrastructure as well. But so pod scaling and also node scaling on this. So it's kubectl get service. Let's just see if the IP address has been assigned. Excellent. So we have an external IP address. Uh, let's see if I can copy. And there we have it. Microsoft loves open source, although Edge doesn't seem to like GIFs. Oh, there you go. It's working now. So we have our systems up and running. So we've gone from, what was that, Dan, in about 10, 15 minutes from not having a Kubernetes cluster to having something deployed and a very happy girl who loves Microsoft and loves open source. Thanks, Justin. That was an awesome demo and great overview of open source. Okay, so let me now wrap this up. Now we have a few resources available for our listeners. Firstly, I've included a bonus video that highlights how to install Docker onto a CentOS virtual machine through the Azure CLI. Then we have a number of open source resources, including the Microsoft Open Source Portal and GitHub repositories. We also have the Microsoft Partner Network. And finally, our own UK cloud solution architect site, the Azure Citadel. As always, it's my wish that you've enjoyed the session. And I'd like to remind you all, these are driven by you. Simply reach out to me on social media if there's anything you would like to see, and I will source the experts and make it happen.